Okay, my apologies to everyone. Um, I got knocked off. <clears throat> so, uh, 703, I'm going to call the meeting to order. This is a special meeting of the Woodbridge Board of Education. On Monday evening, the Board of Ed requested that um, a special meeting be called for tonight with the sole purpose of presenting, reviewing, and discussing the reopening plan for Beecher Road School. Um, originally, the plans were to present this document um, at our regularly scheduled board meeting. Um, so I remind everyone that the document found in e-meeting today is a working draft and administration, along with the reopening committee, um, continue to work on this um, plan before its submission to the State Department of Education on July 24th. So I'd like to just take a moment before we begin to acknowledge the nonstop efforts of the administration and others who are serving on the committee um, are committed to complying with the mandate of the state. So the first thing on the agenda is public comment. But before we do that, I just need to, is the full board here, Bob? Did we check on that? Does Marsha have attendance? Do we want to do a roll call? Yeah, I think that wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, Acting Chair Lynn Piazic is here. Joy Shavers. We are here. Um, there are people that, that want to speak at public comment. So there were a couple of text messages or chat messages that came in. Just right. To make sure that they were captured. I just want to make sure before we begin that we have our board here. Um, so Joyce is here. I see Jeff Townsend. Uh, I'm here. Did you call my name, Jeff Townsend? Thank you, David Ross. Yeah, I'm here. Dan Cowan is here. Um, is Jeff Hughes on? Yes. You need to get out. Jeff Hughes is on. And Megan Jenna. I'm here. I think we have everyone. Is that correct, Marcia? I'm here as well. This is Mike Strambler. Sorry, Mike Strambler. Apologize that I missed um, you. I, I think that's what you meant, Marcia. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, first thing I'm going to ask is this, if you're not speaking to mute, um, please put yourself on mute, please. Maybe the host should mute everybody except for the Board of Ed, and then people have to unmute themselves. Until public comment, that would be great. So I welcome all of you here. It's nice to see all of your faces. Um, public comment is item number three on the agenda. Normally, there is no public comment during a special meeting. However, given the extraordinary circumstances in this unprecedented time, uh, the board has unanimously chosen to include public comment at tonight's meeting. Included in public comment, we have from the following people, and they can be found in e-meeting. All board members have received them. Stephen Lynn Nielsen and Tamara Nielsen, Julio and Johanna Rodriguez, please um, take my apologies if I uh, pronounce your name incorrectly. Mike Haas, Greg Mann, Sherry Storyguard, James Turcos, Christian Turcos, Kathy Zadrowski, president of the Woodbridge Education Association, the Beecher Road School kindergarten teachers and teacher assistants, the Beecher Road School special education team, the sixth grade team of Beecher Road School, the fifth grade team of Beecher Road School, Members of the first and second grade teams of Beecher Road School, the fourth grade team of Beecher Road School, Beecher Road School specialists, including Linda Atchison, Ariane Buzzard, Larissa Clacco, Stephanie Goldberg, Emily Jacober, and Heather. Pick up your Get out of my blankies. My blankies for me. The third grade team of Beecher Road School. I Come believe on. that's on. the list of um, letters that we have received. So we're going to move on to um, public comment, and I have a statement to read, um, which is also included in e-meeting. 
The board welcomes public participation. We ask that speakers please limit their comments to three minutes. Please be aware that the board will not respond to any comments made during the public comment period, except to clarify issues. But we will take into consideration your comments and when appropriate, district administration will follow up with you at a later point in time. During the COVID-19 epidemic, please feel free to submit public comments via email to mdgenero at woodbridgeps.org. And those were the letters we, um, that I just mentioned. So, um, we have some public comment. And so you can raise your hand in the participant thing. And um, Joyce, David, whoever, Bob, I'm not great at this, but um, if someone is raising their hand, if you could identify them for me, I would appreciate it. Come on. Um, can, can we provide instructions to people? Because some people um, are not quite familiar with WebEx and how to put up your hand digitally. Um, so you need to, if you are interested in public comment, um, to go to the participants window and you will see yourself at the top and there's a little hand beside your name that you could then highlight to show that you are raising your hand. I'm also going to ask Carl, if you can hear me, can you mute call in number 17 and call in 24? They're both creating a tremendous amount of background noise. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I was just going to say that if anyone's not muted, you want to try to mute yourself because there's a lot. We just asked, how do you get to the participant? Direction to whomever asked that. I mean, I'm having trouble finding the participant thing today, quite honestly. The participant window is at the bottom of your screen. You have several buttons at the bottom. Amanda Timer, can you please mute yourself, please? At the bottom of your window, there is several buttons. It's a person with three lines to the right of them. That will pop open the window, and you'll be able to see all 170 participants. So, Lynn, is it helpful if we go down the list for you and let you know? Who wants to speak? I don't you see and on my list of participants, I don't see any hands. Raised. So what am I missing, Joyce? Okay. I'm sorry. Um, well, we know Sherry Storyguard. I'm just going down the list. Um, she for sure because she sent in a chat saying that she would like to speak. Let's just go one by one all the way. Wait, hold on with this, uh, Joyce. Though the persons who can see whether or not the hands are raised are Mrs. Sherman and Carl Stiles. So they have to call the people out because they are the hosts. So oh, you're hosts. right. Okay, got it. Thank you, Dan, for that. Good evening, everybody. I'm actually looking at the participant list right now, and I'm not yet seeing any hand raises. I know that people want to speak, so I'm thinking it's just taking them a second to figure that out. I would, if it's okay, I know that. Um, Kim Franklin wanted to speak, and I she think she already mentioned that. So if we wanted to get started with her, she had a public comment to make. Thank you. Um, my hand was raised, so I'm not too sure why that is uh, that you can't see it, but I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you all. You can hear me, Lynn, just give me a thumbs up. Thank you. I can't. Okay. Um, so the WA was receiving feedback from teachers that were basically sharing concerns about the plan to return to in person teaching. And so to better understand the concerns, the WA conducted a survey. And so I'm really here as a representation for the, the teachers who responded to this survey. So I'd like to share with you the data and the slides, but unfortunately, um, I'm not really too sure of what the protocol uh, is or was, and I don't know if um, I'm allowed to do that, but it, certainly the data would be much, uh, I think, um, helpful if you, if you actually saw the slides and the survey data. Um, so, uh, regardless, um, given that um, I didn't make that request and I just didn't get a very clear answer. So, 
Um, I just want to say that 86% of the faculty um, took part in this survey. So it really supports a fairly uh, reliable piece of information that you're going to hear um, tonight. And so when um, <clears throat> looking at that, we basically wanted to understand what the concerns were and, and kind of what, what was on the minds of teachers. And so there was kind of three categories that we asked of teachers. One was, uh, what is their thought process about in-person teaching? And I, I will tell you that that actually was a pretty evenly divided 30, 30, 30 kind of situation where 30% said, yes, I'm in for that. The other was opposed, um, more so opposed. And then there were some just neutral that hadn't really figured it out. And then in terms of hybrid teaching, I just want to share with you that that is pretty much a similar kind of breakdown where it's a little in favor in terms of teachers being opposed. Um, but I think those two uh, uh, suggest that data only because we don't have a whole lot of understanding of what any of that would look like. And so teachers are not able to make kind of decisions around that. And also in terms of in-person teaching, what that all means. Because when we look at distance remote teaching as an option, teachers were significantly in favor, even though I will tell you, most teachers do not. They, they had a hard time with it. It was not ideal teaching. We all know that people want to be in front with the students and that's really the ideal version of teaching. Yet 63.5% of the teachers would prefer to be in um, returning to a distance remote model teaching. And I think that's fairly strong in terms of um, the fact that we all know what most effective teaching really looks like. But then we also went further and asked them, what about synchronous learning? And I just want to define what that is before I even share the data on that. So the definition in terms of synchronous learning that is kind of floating around in the education world is this use of audio and video of in class lessons as they occur live with students who are in school and students who are at home. So it is not hybrid learning. So I just want to clarify that. So in terms of the confidence level of teachers that support this format, um, 64% truly disagree with this format. In terms of uh, concerned about uh, the format of this teaching, um, <clears throat> there's 87% um, that, uh, I'm sorry, I have wrong data. Let me just go back to synchronous learning in terms of confidentiality of classroom engagement. Um, there, was, uh, there was, in terms of confidentiality, 92% we're very concerned about that. So what that means is when you're live teaching, I just want to explain, explain that a bit more. And you're in class, you do a lot of nuanced teaching that effectively reaches in with kids who have modified learning, and also classroom management. And so how that would translate for the kid who is at home is a concern for teachers. And so the teachers who also express- I'm gonna interrupt you for one second. Yes. Carl, can you move 36 and 30, please? They're creating a tremendous amount of background noise, and it's not respectful, Ms. Franklin. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Daniel. So teachers also re responded or were asked about, do they feel like they have the tools to effectively manage both the in-person and that um, distance learning format in terms of synchronous learning? And 72% really felt like they didn't have an understanding to really effectively manage that student at home and also um, whatever dynamic is happening in the classroom. So the other um, factors that we wanted to understand was um, what is the kind of concern and in terms of teachers and students in the community and broad in terms of their health. And so there was a lot of teachers, the reason that they're not a proponent of this in-person teaching is that they're concerned about their own health. And 87.3% uh, really expressed concern. And it has to not do with their own health, but the health of their families and um, potentially elderly people who um, are their family members that reside with them. So there was a lot of um, uh, comments related to that. And then the impact for students in terms of their concern communicated about the student's health uh, there was 90.5% uh, of teachers expressed 
significant concern about students' health. In terms of being able to manage the CDC guidelines, um, the way that this is said is uh, they're concerned about that it won't be met. Not that they won't meet them, but that it will be nearly, it's just impossible for them to manage and ensure that the CDC guidelines will be met. And so 88.9% of teachers really express concern that CDC guidelines will not be met. We will not be able to ensure the safety of students while they're in class um, as we're supposed to be doing. And then teachers also um, responded uh, to several other questions um, that we have, and we'd love to share it with the Board of Education, but I think what I wanted to do is make sure I gave you the, the essential pieces that were, um, I think, the main pieces of this survey that was conducted. There's also a lot of narratives that were shared um, by teachers, and, and I just basically looked at what the themes were that were being expressed by teachers, and I just want to hit those. So. Uh, one of the um, statements was CDC guidelines and management of safety regulations fall on teachers to implement. Um, and so that was said by like at least uh, six or eight te uh, teachers. And there was- Kim, can I just remind you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but three minutes. So you're, you're, a, little, you're a little bit over three minutes. So if you could try and wrap I'm it gonna up. I'm going to wrap it up, Lynn. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, but they also expressed decisions feel rushed and decisions um, don't feel safe. And then their return for in-person teaching just won't be normal teaching. So even if it's in-person, it's still not normal, socially distant, uh, abnormal. And they're concerned about their family. And there's actually teachers who are expressing fear and anxiety. So that's it, Lynn. Thank you so much for, for that reminder. I appreciate Th thank it. Thank you, Kim. And um, you know certainly that information um, is appreciated and uh, if you want to pass that on for us to take a um, a closer look at it, that would be helpful as well. So I thank you for that. Um, I did notice that James Turcos has raised his hand as well. James, remind you of your three minute time limit. Oh, it's actually Kristen Turcos. I live at 14 Bear Hill Road. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'm sorry. It said no, James okay. in the chat. Me too. Um, well, I have not had enough time to read through the entire reopening draft plan and process all of my concerns. I want to address a couple of areas of concern that I have as a parent and an educator in a different district. Um, the Beecher Road School Plan states that students, teachers, and staff must wear face coverings or masks, with exception only for those for whom it is not safe to do so due to medical conditions. First, I would like to say that I have not seen any studies proving that mask wearing for extended periods of time is safe for children. No such study exists to my knowledge. I understand that this is part of the state plan and that the Woodbridge Board of Ed is required to follow their guidelines. However, I strongly hesitate to send my children to school as guinea pigs for a prolonged mask wearing study. In addition, there must be a plan in place within the school to protect the staff and students who cannot wear a mask due to medical conditions from being bullied, ostracized, or discriminated against during the school year. I have already read a multitude of comments on social media from parents and educators that are discriminatory against students with medical conditions who cannot wear masks. It is not appropriate for any community member to judge whether or not a teacher, staff member, or student is medically able to wear a mask. That is a discussion between patient and doctor. There is so much division regarding this issue already, and it would be heartbreaking to hear of a child being bullied because they are medically unable to wear a mask. I urge the Board of Education to discuss an appropriate response to being inclusive of all to address the social and emotional well being of our community during this already challenging and difficult time. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, Carl or Annalise, is there anyone else who's raising their hand? I Dr. Dr. Sherry Storygard is raising her. Thank you, Joyce. Sherry Storygard. Can you hear me? Can you, speak? Can you hear me? My name is Sherry Storygard. I am a parent of children at the school and pediatrician to many children in the community. My mother, father, sister, and brother are teachers. 
I am grateful to the many people who have spent countless hours in meetings already trying to figure this out. You have a very hard job and it is very complicated. Parts of our larger system have let us down and they've let you down and we are forced to come together locally to find solutions. I want to make a few observations and suggestions with the assumption that some in-school learning will happen. That will be guided by continued data, COVID numbers in our community, and public health guidelines. I am not going to speak whether it should or shouldn't happen, but what I, what I do suggest if it does. The risk of COVID-19 transmission is significantly reduced by being outside in open air. I believe that it is very possible to have large parts of the school day be outside in open air. I believe that our community is capable of helping the school have sun and rain shades or tents and is capable of raising money for every child to have proper rain gear and cold weather gear, lap desks and personal mats for children to use outside. I believe that outdoor tables and chairs can be donated. Being outside would be allow a break from masks. It would also allow for easier cohorting, which I will get to next. Skeptics may question what the weather and other obstacles, which while real, are possible to overcome with community-wide creativity. Call on parents to gather these materials the same way you ask them to get markers and to problem solve for weather plans. We know that small group cohorting is critical for safety. It also allows for better flexibility and decision-making for me and for you, should someone have sick symptoms. I believe that having much of school be outside, it will be more possible to have only small groups together inside as a cohort. For example, half of a class inside, half outside. I know that the struggle with this is staffing and that is hard. If small group cohorting while inside is a goal, the issue of busing is hard. I believe that if you survey parents, many will opt out of busing for safety reasons or for the good of the community. Those who do not have other options can be bused in much smaller, safer numbers. There are ways to have drop off and pickup of many cars work especially if each class convenes at its own dedicated place outside, and especially if you recruit parent volunteers to help children get to and from their outdoor meeting spots. I believe that the goal should be for all to wear face coverings, if possible, and when medically appropriate. If given ample opportunity from breaks, with breaks from masks while outside, this won't be as hard to do. Many children have shown that they can do this. And I have talked to many camps that have been in session with masks. The first two weeks need constant reminders to put your mask over your nose and then it gets easier. In order to imagine most of school outside, one needs to let go of some preconceived notions about what school is and of the usual ways of doing things and usual ways of learning. We did that last spring already. We can do it again. This pandemic is forcing humans to consider options we have never needed to think about in the past. I urge the committee and all of us as a community to start from a place of considering the outdoors to be the primary place of convening school and the primary place of learning. When obstacles arise, call on the community to help problem solve. We've seen the big hoot. We've seen how much we can do and raise together. Your parents can do this. If, if in-school learning happens, it will be hard and we'll need a lot of tweaking as experience is gained. 
but using the outdoors is especially possible in Woodbridge and it's especially possible at Beecher Road School. It has the potential to be absolutely beautiful, absolutely fulfilling, healing, and most of all, safer. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I see that Darren D has asked in the chat to speak. Darren, I believe it's Hi, Darren. yeah. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. Thank you. That's okay. I just have a comment. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I totally understand. Not understanding raising your hand. So this is I, I you know I, I feel like other people who have presented were, were very eloquent in their presentations and it was very thought out beforehand and I appreciate that very much. My, mine is more of an off the cuff sort of comment, um, somewhat of a response to the teacher survey. So for us and for my family, last semester went very very poorly. The second half of last semester, the way that distance learning was handled for us was not good. We did not feel that there was sufficient contact with teachers. We did not feel that the amount of instruction that was given to our child was sufficient by any means. And we basically felt that we were stuck having the buck pass to us having to teach, which for us was very challenging. And my concern is what will the distance learning plan actually be for this year? One, if parents don't wanna send their children to school. Two, if we have to go into another lockdown. I don't have a clear sense of that. And then when I hear that the teachers are quite hesitant around synchronous learning, I, I feel like by default, again, this is gonna fall onto our laps as the parents. And to me, that is entirely unacceptable. So I feel like I need more information and I need to see a constructive plan about what's gonna happen if we need to if we need to lock down or what's gonna happen if, if ultimately what the school decides to do is doesn't feel safe. So that's my sort of query being thrown out there. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, could you just state your full name and address so that it, it can be added to the minutes? Yes, of course. It's Darren David for Roseview Lane. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other hands raised or anyone that I've missed in the chat that wishes to make public comments? Kathy, 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 you like this yeah. Well, Dan, do you see someone? Katerina. Yeah, Kathy. Kathy Zadrowski, president of WEA. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Kathy. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, my name is Katerina Zadrowski, and I am the president of the Woodbridge um, Education Association. I am here tonight representing the amazing teachers at Beecher Road School. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. To the Beecher Road School administration, Board of Education, parents, families, and the greater- Oh my God, you're saying it's dying. You keep breaking out. I'm addicted to it now. Thanks a lot. Sorry. You know what? Can that person- Ty, Yeah, Ty Lynn, can you mute yourself, please? T-Y-T-L-Y-H-N-E. Thank you. We have always given great pride in being Beecher teachers, and we love this community dearly. We are part of a community of brilliant educators who continuously learn from one another. We are proud to say at Beecher Road School that we know what is right for students. On the state and national level, educators' concerns are largely being left out of school reopening plan because they do not match the economic interests of this decision. Furthermore, these plans are being crafted while largely ignoring the fact that many teachers may fall into high risk categories and may not be able to return to in person teaching without proper staffing. How can we possibly meet the demands of in person or hybrid learning models being proposed. We care about you and your children deeply. It is impossible to simultaneously enact safe social distancing measures and keep school a joyful. Um, vibrant place for children. The children will be sitting at their desks all day working on iPads or worksheets with little to no movement. This is a stark contrast to the school we all know and badly wish to return to. We are gravely concerned about how these measures will impact the long-term social emotional well-being of children. 
from, for many reasons, the in-person and hybrid models being proposed are sacrificing the quality of education that could be provided remotely. Please hear the call to action that is being echoed by educators across the nation. Going back to school is not right or safe for students. Public health experts and scientific data have made it clear by proposing reopening school in person, you are risking the lives of the Beecher community. Research has proven that children transmit COVID-19 at the same rate as adults. We are fortunate to have an expert living in our community. Dr. Allison Galvani, director of the Yale Center of Infectious Disease Modeling and Analysis. She has publicly shared on N NPR that opening schools would be reckless. She also stated that she would not be sending her children back to school in the fall. Furthermore, she has been interviewed on CNN saying that opening schools would be adding fuel to the fire. Teachers need professional development and time to fully prepare for a robust distance learning model. We ask that you support our teachers in Woodbridge by preparing now to offer the most rigorous distance learning model for children this fall. The health and well being of Beecher community needs to be the priority as we move forward with the planning and reopening. Thank you. That's Katarina Zadrowski, WEA president. Thank you, Kathy, for your comments. Um, next, I have Krista and Greg Mann. Hi, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Um, certainly, just want to acknowledge that. Uh, we're in a terribly difficult um, situation, and for um, in many respects, there's truly no uh, correct answer that we can um, all agree upon right now. Um, I have a concern specifically uh, regarding medical waivers for those who um, are unable to wear a mask throughout the school day, whether it's student, staff, teacher, um, whomever. Um, it is my understanding as a healthcare provider that. Um, if one is unable to tolerate a mask, perhaps they probably have a chronic condition to begin with, whether that's a medical condition, um, mental health condition, whatever the case is. Um, but in not wearing a mask, is that going to pose an added risk to them um, of becoming ill? Okay, um, so that's one of my concerns. And then my other concern is, um, you know, certainly whenever you obtain a medical waiver for immunizations or, or whatever, um, there is a medical representative from the school who has to review all of these things. So is there going to be an outlined process for um, what conditions are uh, going to be, uh, you know, acceptable to um, use a medical waiver? Um, and who, what are the qualifications of the person that's, um, you know, reviewing those things? In the interest of um, certainly you know, the general population, but for those who could be more um, compromised or vulnerable, are we just opening up that added risk to them by allowing them to attend without using a mask? Um, again, thank you uh, everybody for their um, continued work and efforts. And I think we all probably agree that we just want the best for our families and our children and um, certainly have never encountered any of this before. So, um, it is very hard to find uh, statistical data regarding the use of long, you know, masks for children and things like that because we've never encountered this before. Um, so, those are, those are just my thoughts. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I have Jessica Halperin who wishes to speak. Oops. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Jessica Halperin for Eldersley Lane. I'm a working mother of three children who are at Beecher Road School, and I'm going to address what we will need to succeed when we return to distance learning, because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So the unique value of a public school system lies in two areas providing a basic academic education and providing a sense of community and socialization. The upcoming distance learning must be different from how it was this spring in order for the Board of Ed and Beecher Road School to meet those two unique needs that cannot be met anywhere else. I'll begin with the sense of community, which Beecher Road School can and should be providing even from a distance. 
we need to reach out through the void that we have experienced and we will continue to experience. And we have the resources to do it. For example, the librarian can send out book recommendations. Are you a fourth grader who loves reading about unicorns? This is the book series for you. You can offer parents to have their children give video book reviews and recommendations. The nurses and PE staff can lead group exercise either in person at least six feet apart or online or tutorials and hand washing or what to look out for um, for strep throat. The special services team can provide mental health tutorials to students and their parents at a variety of times. The office staff can provide, hey, today is happy Thursday and today is National Brownie Day. It's not asking for substantive academic communications. It's asking for a sense of community that if we were there in person, we would be receiving. How about inviting parents who feel comfortable to allow their children to record a morning message? All of these have been adopted already by various school systems within our state who are subject to the same restrictions that we in Woodbridge are. And I don't see a reason why we can't offer those services through the void to our students and to our families who are struggling and suffering through through our remote and through our distance. As for providing a basic academic education, the teachers frankly need to be more accessible to their students. Before the pandemic, teachers were readily accessible for seven hours a day, five days a week. I'm not asking for teachers who are stressed and anxious, just like the parents are, to be chained to their chairs. What I am asking is for students to be able to perhaps email their teachers, perhaps have set office hours every day when they are struggling through some academic assignment to be able to reach out to them rather than have such a wall be put up between the students and the teachers. I know that teachers got into academics because they love children. Well, having that distance and blaming it on technology or blaming it on confidentiality concerns is not doing anyone any good. And it's certainly not using the resources that Woodbridge already has in place. Thank you very much for your time. I would really like to see Woodbridge continue to be the leader that it had been in the past. And this, ag this pandemic has affected all of us. I'd like to see us turn a corner and look at the resources we already have to work together. As you broke up at the end, I think you might be finished. Lynn, I see that Amy Meacham has raised her hand as well, I believe. Thank Before Amy starts you. speaking, can Miss Mulligan, Lee, I think it is, please mute yourself. You're creating some background noise. A Amy Meacham. Thank you, Lynn. I was not planning to speak tonight. Um, I am a Woodbridge not... resident. I am a Beecher parent. I am a third grade teacher at Beecher Road School. And my heart is breaking at this conversation mostly because there is no easy answer. And for any parent who thinks that the teachers are taking lightly our proposal to stay in distance learning, please hear it from me and my cracking voice that there is nothing I would rather do than to be able to be back in the classroom with my students. But please also know that I am not willing to risk my life or the lives of my family members, or be responsible for the lives of any of my students by going back under unsafe conditions. I am not going to read the letter that my third grade team wrote, but I please implore anyone on this meeting to go and read the letters from the teachers. We care about your students. We know Distance learning is not ideal. We know we need to do better. 
I please hope that you can understand that we need parents to support our need to be safe. Thank you. Amy, thank you. Um, Mackenzie Granada has asked to speak. Hi, thank you. Um, Mackenzie Granada, 124 uh, North Raysbrook Road, Woodbridge. I have um, two children at Beecher Road School. And um, I just wanted to say, this is a really emotional subject for all of us. Um, we came off of a very emotional spring for teachers and for parents and for the students. Um, so it's really highly charged, um, but I would just really encourage everyone to read the letters that um, Ms. Meacham just mentioned, and I just put the link in the chat where we can find them. Um, and I also, I, I, I know that we've had Board of Ed meetings since um, the pandemic and the um, decision to go remote, but I wish we had had like this conversation, you know, so much earlier and, and people have been having these conversations, but I think now um, we should hear the plan um, before we get even more anxious about what is not known and hear the large, larger details um, before getting worked up about the smaller ones. So for instance, even though masks are a very important one, I know that it's a very highly charged subject. Um, and I think also distance learning is a high subject. Um, people, everyone has to decide what is right for them, but know that people are thinking about in the backs of their minds how we make distance learning better, um, how we can put safety measures in place. So I think we just need to take a step back, <laughs> take a breath, and um, solve the really big problems facing our community first, make sure that everyone is safe, um, and stays well, um, and, and then make sure that we can address everybody's educational and emotional needs. It's a really, really tough spot, and not everybody is going to be 100%, and many of us won't even be 50% satisfied. But what I would ask from our community is to not make decisions that put other people at risk. So if, for instance, we do find ourselves in a classroom environment, um, to not to not um, enter children or um, staff into this environment where it's likely they could either get sick or get others sick. And that may seem like a common sense thing, but if you're talking about um, enrolling students who can't follow certain guidelines because of their own um, conditions or the conditions of people around them, then it's time to make smart decisions for for them and for the people around them. Um, so we, you know, we see all these signs like we will make it through this together, and, and we need to act like that. Like we will get through this together by listening to everyone, by listening to everyone's concerns. But let's listen to the plan, and then let's come to it from a problem-solving place, and not a place of no, but a place of how do we make this better. Um, it's a starting point, and how can we make this better so everybody stays safe? That's that's my two cents. Thank you, Mackenzie. And just for clarification purposes, that's what we're going to do tonight, which is to be reviewing the plan. So thank you for that. The other thing I would like to comment on is to thank people who have given the Beecher teachers in the chat um, their um, thanks and appreciation. Um, the Board of Education also acknowledges the hard work that the teachers have done, and um, we really uh, appreciate it from the bottom of our heart what's being done for the kids in uh, here. So thank you for that as well. Next, I have on my list Nicole Chick, who wishes to speak. <laughs> I'm here. Can you see um, me? Can you hear me? 
Uh, Ms. Rooney, can you mute yourself, please? You're creating a little bit of background noise. Christina Hart, Rooney. Okay, am I good? Um, hi, everyone. I am Nicole Chick. I live at 38 Deer Run Road. Um, I'm also a kindergarten teacher. Um, if I could say all the words that Amy Meacham said again, I would. Um, but I will read um, part of the kindergarten team letter that we sent in as part of public comment. Uh, we are writing to show our support of the Beach Road School community and acknowledge the incredibly challenging work the administrative team has been doing along with the reopening committee. We would also like to take this opportunity to share our concerns regarding the reopening of, school, of the school building for in-person instruction in just a few short weeks. First and foremost, our primary concern is the health and well being of our staff, students, and families. Information on this virus is fluid, changing daily, and there are still so many unknowns. Recent, re recent research states being outdoors is safer than indoors, and schools deliver instruction indoors. There is also growing evidence that this virus is airborne. While businesses and corporations in our state are not allowed to operate at full capacity, why are we being encouraged to enter a building with a history of HVAC, HVAC problems at full capacity, five days a week, seven hours a day? Mm. Um, for some of our children, this is the first time in a school setting. We are trying to teach them routines and procedures while also building a classroom community through kindness and compassion. Having to attempt to remain six feet away while trying to calm their fears about being in a new environment without their family members is impossible and heartbreaking to think about. We understand the importance of students' mental health and the need for them to socialize with others. Opening schools would at first appear to be the best solution for these issues. When children and parents are envisioning this, it is easy to picture school pre-COVID. Given our current COVID situation, socialization will be extremely difficult in school. CDC guidelines recommend students face forward while direct instruction takes place. Small group work and or partner work will be impossible as will any sort of collaboration. Kindergarten classrooms are beautiful, messy places filled with, <laughs> sorry, songs and movement, sharing of supplies and materials. Children Thank you, Nicole. Keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Children busy building with blocks and playing, as well as gathering together on the rug to learn. None of this will be able to happen. And in turn, our kindergarten classrooms will now, look, now, now feel cold, distant, and very quiet. Deep breath. I'm going to go. As much as our hearts want to be back in the building doing what we love, our sensibility is telling us we should be spending time now to develop a more robust distance learning plan so we can build a classroom community and develop relationships with our students in a meaningful way virtually. This will ensure not only really a thoughtful and calm start to the year, it will also the families at Beecher safe. Thank you for your consideration and time. I am reading it. This is from the kindergarten team and teaching assistants. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I have Rebecca. Rampo, who's on the phone, wishes to speak. We'll give you a minute to unmute yourself. Maybe Carl can unmute. Okay the uh, people like on the, and then we'll identify who that is. Rebecca D-Y-R-A-M-P-L-E, do you wish to speak? Rebecca Dalrymple. I think you have to hit star six to unmute. You're on the phones. I'm going to move on. Are you here? Are you here? Okay, I'm going to move on to Constantine 
D R E K O N A K I S. Oh, it's no, it's muted. Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, it's actually Joy Draconicus. That's, uh, we're just on my husband's computer. Um, I just, I wasn't prepared to speak, but I do want to, you know, comment on the heartfelt commentary from our teachers. Um, I live at 22 Richard Sweet Drive. I've got two kids in the school and I am a teacher in another district. And I'm, I'm, I think like most of us, I'm anxious to hear the plan, but I'm also um, feeling like a lot of this uh, planning of the different, planning for the different possible scenarios that could occur is a bit of a, a waste of time. And I don't mean that in a, in a rude way. I mean it because we're all following the data and the trends. And I think that most of us feel that the inevitable is that at some point we will be closing school, causing another disruption um, for our kids. So my thinking is that if we could be spending this time, if we could be saying, okay, we are gonna call it right now, like some other states are starting to do and say, we will not be returning to school in person because it is likely not going to be the safest option for us. We should be given this time so that we can figure out how to make distance learning as meaningful for our students as we can. How we can get them the materials that they might need, math manipulatives, books, um, art supplies, all the sorts of things that, you know, I'm not, I'm not an elementary teacher, but I know there are so many things that could be sent home for students. Um, I think teachers could be spending time pre-recording lessons. Teachers could be spending time collaborating to figure out how we are going to um, deliver content to our students in a way that is more meaningful and um, more planned out than it was in the spring, which was an emergency learning plan. It was not, you know, business as usual. And that's something that in my district, we talked about all the time. This is a, this is a Band-Aid. But now we have, the teachers have the time. It's summer, this is our time. We have the time to be able to do this instead of being pulled in different directions to take surveys and, and go to meetings and figure out the possibility for in-school, hybrid, or at home. I wish that we would just as a community demand that the safest option right now is at home. It, it does, it's exactly what Amy Meacham said that we all would love to be in school. That's where the magic happens. It doesn't happen on the screen, but we can do better if we were given time. And that's, that's all I wanted to comment on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Tyma. Wishes to speak? You appear unmuted. You should be able to speak. Amanda Taima in the chat asked to speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Amanda Tyma. I um, live at 5 Cowpath Lane in Woodbridge. I have two kids in um, Beecher Road School. Um, my biggest concern and comment is both of my children are special needs. One of them is currently on an IEP, the other one will be. And we're not, in the spring, it was very difficult um, because it was so fast and IEPs weren't necessarily having to be followed because we didn't have the, the school didn't have the um, resources to do it. But my son, my oldest son going into second grade cannot go to school with a mask on. He cannot wear a mask um, or if oxygen level drops. Therefore, we have decided as his parents to keep him home and do distance learning. But we, I need a plan in place sooner rather than later to acquire what he needs. And my second is going into first grade and he will also have an IEP when school starts. And I don't feel like we as parents of special needs kids are getting enough guidance of things. 
I personally don't feel school should be in session right now for my kids. Um, they, I also have a 20 month old who is immunocompromised, so I cannot send my kids to school. But I feel like also doing, sorry, I'm a little flustered, it's bedtime. But um, I feel like the idea of doing outside learning is wonderful for most kids, but what about the kids who can't do it? My daughter, who will, is not in school this year, but will be next year, has albinism. She's an albino. She can't be outside for longer than 20 minute periods at a time, even in the shade. So she is going to have to be inside while everyone else is outside. Um, I just feel like the special needs kids are being over, not overlooked, but it's everyone's focusing on the typical children instead of the kids who need more. The kids who can't wear a mask because they're not able to. And I have personally been um, talked down to and said that my kids don't deserve to go to school because they can wear a mask. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's frustrating as a parent of a special needs kids to know that my kid can't, my child not being able to wear a mask is more dangerous to him than it would be to a typical child. His lungs couldn't handle COVID. He probably wouldn't make it. So that's why we chose to keep him home. But like, I also, if my kids are going to be in school, if my kids are doing distance learning, I need to hire a tutor to come here. I have four special needs kids. All four of them are. So I need to hire a tutor. So I also need to have time to handle hiring a tutor that can handle all of their needs. And I just want to say thank you to all the teachers. Um, I highly appreciate everything that you did in the spring. Um, it was everything that you could do. And I am very concerned about them going back to school. I'm concerned about teachers having to be in a room of 19, 20 kids and what the risk for them is because it's proven that adults have more of a risk of COVID than children do. So what's the risk to the teachers and the faculty being in a room with that many kids? And that is all, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Um, if any board member sees anything else in chat that I missed, please speak up. Uh, Stephen Lawrence would like to comment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Just quickly wanted to say I, I so appreciate everyone at the Beecher community. I'm Stephen Lawrence. I live at 44 Old Quarry Road, and I have two children at Beecher Road School. My one comment would be. It's, you know, it's not in my hands to determine whether we'll be back in school or whether we'll be doing remote learning in the fall. But I will say as a parent who attempted to be conscientious with that process, um, it would be extremely helpful to really identify the bare minimum that, or, the, or rather the essentials that students will need to learn. I think there was a real intention to try to replicate a classroom experience and that's just not going to happen in the home setting. So basically, I think for the parents I've talked to, and as and many of you are parents yourselves, you know, you know, as as the months went on, the ability to wrangle our children into focusing on school became especially difficult. And if this is going to be the fall, possibly into the spring, then I think they're really in terms of that rethinking of what our expectations are for distance learning for our children. We, we really have to dial it back to something that is actually going to be a reasonable goal. Otherwise, both parents and children are going to get frustrated with the process. So just my thought I wanted to share. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, um, Stephen. Uh, Joy Prudhomme would like to speak. Hi, my name is Joy Prudhomme, and I'm a parent of a soon-to-be fifth grader at Beach Road School, and I'm also the PTO president. 
Um, and I've been a full-time volunteer at the school for the last five years. Um, I just want to say that, you know, none of this is ideal. And I really, really cannot imagine how much of a challenge this is for all of you. Um, we, you know, obviously this is an unprecedented time. But I feel like our teachers have spoken very clearly as seen in their letters, and we should be spending this time to really concentrate on how we can be a leader as we have been. Um, we have a wonderful reputation, a wonderful school system, and we really could do amazing things with the distance learning mo model. And, um, you know, I got to see it, it was rough. I mean, we, we had the rug pulled out from underneath us, right? No one could have prepared for what happened this spring. But as a MAG parent, which would be by far, by far the most difficult thing to recreate um, on, in, on an online <laughs> uh, version because it's, you know, 80 plus kids and it's just amazing, um, just wild and it's just it's such an amazing community and they were able to in the end pull this community together which was shocking it was you know it was so it is possible I guess is my point even though it seems really daunting and I believe a lot of parents did not get that experience with what happened in the spring but if the teachers had enough time to focus on that, I know all of our teachers, having worked with them all of these years, are just so amazing. And there's so much passion and love for our students and for what they do and their profession that they'll they'll come up with the most amazing things. I also want to say that I spent the majority of yesterday as PTO president with my treasurer and other members of our executive board to try to even attempt to look at what this school year could be as we are, as most of you probably know, a very active PTO. How could we raise money? How could we have special events? All of those things. And it was very, very depressing to literally go down the list and, and just scratch, scratch, scratch everything. But you know, at one point I had an epiphany and I'm like, you know what? I think I think we could do some of these special events virtually and have, if we were doing a distance learning model, we could have a kindergarten Les Julian assembly virtually. This is possible. And you know what? COVID's not going away, right? And we're gonna have to live like this for a little while. And I think that we need to just really figure out how, how to embrace it. Um, or we're gonna, you know, risk really losing some amazing teachers um, because given the choice between family and health and um, life um, or teaching somebody else's child, um, I think it's a no brainer. Um, I appreciate everything that you guys are doing right now. I do not envy your position at all, um, but having worked with you for many years, I know that you will do the right thing for our teachers and for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, Nellie Chevelle Kina. Okay, Nellie, you're on. I don't know if I. We can hear you. Okay, so I just wanted to ask uh, one little thing that I didn't hear, or maybe I missed it. Uh, I'm personally right now working on a uh, plan to reopen, I don't know, you know, like creative arts workshop in New Haven. And we've been going through the CDC guidelines that require us to have students at six feet distance between each other. So how is the school addressing that? How is it possible to have 20? I, I mean, I determined for my rooms at creative arts workshop, we can have, we can manage mostly six kids and we have probably the rooms uh half size of the classrooms um i don't know i'm from the mac community so kind of like half of the mac classrooms 
So we can put only six kids over there. So how's that going to work? I don't really understand in school. And another concern that a lot of parents are uh, raising here is like uh, structured um, online learning. That is a real concern. I mean, if we're doing, I mean, we definitely have to do online learning, but it has to be structured. It cannot be sent to kids in a long plans what to do, when to do, or do whatever you want, all those prompts of the projects or whatever. This is not manageable, absolutely not manageable. And uh, I understand parents, especially if everybody have to work at home. I mean, I don't understand how is it possible to be a teacher for your child and do your work even from home at the same time. So um, that is just my concerns. Um, like. That's what I wanted to ask and uh, see how is that addressed, like six foot in between kids. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. Um, if anyone can help me, I don't see any other in the chat, any other who want to speak. I don't know if there are any hands raised. Uh, Carl, I don't know if you see any that have uh, hands raised. I see. Uh, There's one person, Diane Lenskold. Fine. Diane? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I just thought I'd, I maybe we can add a different perspective. I work at a nonprofit organization, um, the Boys and Girls Club. They're a national organization, and many of the clubs had stayed open to help provide childcare for essential workers. Um, we, our particular club decided to close and we had worked closely with the office of early childhood to when we were planning to reopen for summer camp. Um, we were given kind of strict guidelines to how many kids that we can service. And it was based on how many rooms we had in our building. So we had small groups of 10 children. They, you know, we, they kept siblings together as, as opposed to past years, we would have the same age kids, but. To reduce risk, they would keep siblings in the same room, the same pod. Um, they would only stay in one room. They don't share, like they don't share materials. Um, they play outside. But again, it's very limited capacity. So I think it's just for me, like I've seen it. We've this is now our, I think we're starting our fourth week of summer camp. It's you know it's going well. But again, I can't imagine going to school where you have 800 children in the same building. I mean, if you go to a store, you know they're limiting how many people can shop. So I don't see why we would just take that leap to go from, you know, a somewhat controlled environment to then just, you know, flooding one particular room. Um, I was personally surprised at how many teachers, you know, had such emotional letters, but it's really, it's helpful to hear. Um, I don't know if there were any teachers who were still willing to work, but I was wondering if maybe we can kind of propose more of a hybrid model for some families who would like to have an in-person experience for the school year, that they have that ability to go in, have very small groups, have a controlled space, you know, one teacher per group, don't, you know, cross-contaminate in case there is a problem that, that you know, it's kind of controlled in that group. Um, and then for other parents who want to elect, you know, the, the distance learning. Um, just wondering if it doesn't have to be like, you know, it's one or the other, but perhaps a blend. And, I'm sure that's an administrative nightmare, but I just wanted to bring that up as an option. Um, and I also wanted to say, I love uh, Dr. Storygard's suggestion that if there is in person to have it outside as much as possible. So thanks. Thank you. Um, Ching Lu has raised, has um, asked in the comment to speak. Asked in the chat, Jing. Q I N G L I U has asked in the chat to speak. Does Ching you, you, you might be on you.
maybe come back after the next speaker. I, I'll try you again. Uh, Rebecca. Dalrymple. Dalrymple. Sorry. <laughs> Rebecca. Yes. Can you hear me this time? Hello. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry about earlier. I was, I was hitting star six anyway. Um, my name is Rebecca Dalrymple. I have two children at Beach Road School. They're going into fourth and sixth grade. I live at Eight Forest Glen Drive um, here in Woodbridge. And I just uh, wanted to comment. I, I absolutely care about the health of the teachers, the faculty, my own children, my own family. Um, so I, I absolutely appreciate all the comments that have been made on the call. Um, but I, I, I feel very strongly about, you know, what a lot of the other parents have said, which is it's extremely hard to be in a two working, um, you know, family, you know, to, to, two working parents and to also be a teacher to your parent, to your children and to do it well, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible to do, to do both. And, you know, my major concern as a parent is that. Um, our children are, are getting lost here and the education that they deserve is, is getting lost. So I understand that we might need to have remote school and that's okay, but I do think it has to be drastically different than it was. I, I, I don't, you know, I think there's ways to do it. You know, my, teach, my um, sister had, had her children in virtual learning in Rhode Island and they had instruction all morning long. They had instruction from nine to 12. And at the end of the day, they had kind of work sheets and you know lessons and, and other kind of assignments pushed to them for the second half of the day. And I think that that would be a more preferable model for me um, because I think it is important that our children get that, that face-to-face instruction. Um, and you know, uh, kids all learn differently. Um, so I, I, I just echo the comments of a lot of the other parents, which is that we really need to do it differently than we did. Um, and I, and I, you know, I just hope that, um, you know, all of the parents commentary are being heard as well. And again, I don't think anyone's goal is to endanger the children, the teachers, the families, but I think we need a different solution than what we had last year. Um, so that's all. Thank you, Rebecca. Can I can I just mention something? Um, you know, we appreciate the chats that people are sending um, that are supportive of each other, but there are some chats out there that are not respectful and and considerate. Um, I think everyone is really trying to do their best and um, be very honest and candid with how they feel. And so I would urge any of you before you hit the send button on your chat just to bear that in mind. Thank you, Joyce. I was just going to also comment on that and say that um, I would hope that everyone can be resp respectful of others' um, thoughts and opinions. Um, I'm going to ask again, Ching Lu. All right, we'll move on to Robert Bayer. So I can see her trying to speak. Oh, but you I can't, can't hear her. So Ching, you're um, muted, perhaps. Dan, can you see her? She might be muted. I can see her. I think it's Q I N G. It is Ching. It's it's she is moving her mouth, but somehow there's no sound. Ching, we can't hear you. Uh, go go to the next person. Come back to her again. Maybe she'll figure it out. Okay. Um, Robert Bayer. Hi. Uh, first thing I want to do is I want to thank all the excellent Beecher teachers. You know, I, I know last year was difficult, and I thought you did a, a great job. I am the parent of two little boys who uh, one is a rising eighth grader, one is sixth grader. Um, I'm also an emergency physician, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I've seen a little bit over the past few months and the uh, Connecticut community in general and Woodbridge has been great in keeping us 
of this virus low. I'm so happy I live in Connecticut and I'm working in Connecticut rather than elsewhere. Um, that being said, uh, inevitably, um, if you open your schools, uh, the rate of spread is going to um, Right now, I think, uh, you know, the level of the virus in Connecticut is low enough that we could probably keep it under control and open up schools if we had appropriate testing. Unfortunately, uh, the people who I refer for outpatient testing for the COVID virus have to wait 11 days or so, up to two weeks for the results of their test. That is not robust spot testing. Saying that, we can't open schools safely. I think we put our teachers at great risk because inevitably this is spread. I think if you open up the school, you have to be prepared to have some serious conversations with your children when inevitably a friend gets sick, a teacher gets sick, God forbid. And that's something that I think the community in general has to really think about before you know, we open a, a school. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to listen to our teachers. And I think there are definitely some concerns that we would not be able to keep them safe. I think we need to support our teachers to figure out how to do more. Uh, we meet the parents' needs to teach our children. Um, and we need to support the, the teachers making appropriate lesson plans. Uh, and I know they'll do a great job. So. Thank you, Robert. Um, so I'm just going to let you know that Carl, uh, who is uh, our tech person, is trying to unmute um, Ching, but there's no sound. Ching has commented that she's going to type her comments. So I also have ALRL. ALRL perhaps wants to make a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can hear you. Hello, I'm Alexis Loss. I live at 1122 Racebrook Road. Um, I just had um, just a couple brief comments, um, some of which um, have already been said um, and a couple others that um, hadn't. Um, one is um, I definitely understand uh, the concerns that were that are brought uh, by the teachers. Um, but at the same time, um, we, my husband and I both work full time and this uh, distance learning was extremely challenging. Um, and if we are going to, or when we are going to need to do distance learning, uh, I really feel like a better plan needs to be put in place. Um, it really ended up being um, a list of what activities needed to be done um, no live instruction and, um, I didn't really feel like, uh, my child got much learning in. Um, so at least for the, you know, the school year, this upcoming school year, I'd really like to see some actual details of how, um, it's going to improve. The other thing I have concerns about is, um, uh, obviously the mask thing is a, a contentious issue. Um, but I wanted the, I wanted there to be some comment as to um, for those children that are not going to be wearing masks um, and, you know, are potentially um, going to be, um, I don't want to use the word infectious, but basically potentially spreading uh, virus, how um, their uh, risk is, their risk of themselves and other children are going to be mitigated. Um, so that's, that's about it. Thank you for your comments. Ching, are you, um, I, I see you. Can you, you want to try one more time? No voice. Okay, we'll move on to Sebastian. Um, Busin? Busin. Busin. So my name is- Yeah, Larson, well, mute again. Just before Sebastian starts. Hello. So my name is Sebastian Rizin. Uh, I have one child at Beecher and one entering high school. Uh, I didn't prepare the decision.
uh, I see people are scared and fear come from unknown. And uh, USA, USA is not an island, and everybody should look at what was done in other countries regarding school reopening. Studies and lesson learned. Uh, not just make their mind from the TV media, who are, which are so politically sided on the two sides. There is a lot of experience to gain from European countries who started to reopen school as soon as May. And they did some stuff right, some stuff wrong, and uh, pe uh, the faculty should look at uh, how the, it was handled in Europe. That's all. Thank you very much. Um, Ching has posted in the chat, there seems to be a division among the expectations for the school year. Some want safety first, some want children to go back to school for various reasons. Some are concerned about social and emotional needs. Would it be possible to probe to see what is our consensus on this? Second point, Meg has done a fantastic job in the spring. I know there are various teaching styles, maybe distance. Learning, distant learning does have its potential. My third point is that I like what Dr. Storygard's idea. I am wondering if it could be a distance, distant learning with some emotion, social emotional meet outdoor model. We can do distant learning and maybe one day or two days a week, a class or a grade can go to beach or outdoor for social purpose. Thank you a lot for giving me many chances. I need to figure out my microphone configuration. Um, is there anyone else, Dan, that you see or Joyce that you can see? I don't see anybody else in the chat right now. I don't see anyone either. Okay. Thank you all for your comments. Appreciate them. Appreciate the time that you've taken to speak to the Board of Education.